the compute requirements in order to have enough cognition to be able to do that are so enormous you can't just infect like mommy and daddy's computer right you owe in fact no how do you how do you know that yeah Kara and i were just talking about like how might you get like sort of full stack automation of not just exploit development but also like exploit development and then sort of like penetrating networks and pivoting laterally through networks um all in the same system like I, like uh, currently that that seems kind of far off but that's the kind of uh, capability that I think would be like really transformative in the cyber warfare space. Um, but I think even maybe just like a huge increase in exploit development uh, would be maybe the thing I think is more likely than that, that would also be really transformative. Or basically, if you think about stealing information from say an AI lab or a company or a government or whoever, there's different sort of phases in terms of exploit process. So there's like an, a whole attack chain. So you might start with recon where you like try to figure out um, what surface area there is, who might work for the organization, what websites, what domains they might have, what IP addresses, et cetera. Um, and then you sort of look for vulnerabilities. Um, and then if you find vulnerabilities, you exploit those vulnerabilities, that gives you initial access. Um, so say you might have compromised a user's account and then you try to use that user's account to gain more access. Um, or it might mean that you've like compromised some server um, in the sort of company's infrastructure that you want to target. Um, and then you sort of try to move laterally through their infrastructure, you know, by exploiting more vulnerabilities or misconfigurations until you can basically access the target assets that you want, information, whatever. Um, and it might be, you know, it might be possible to automate this whole process. Um, so people currently are working on automating, you know, different parts of it. Um, but something that would be really pretty crazy is if uh, you could automate the whole thing um, so that basically you had a system that could like, you could just point at a target and it could compromise them um, and exfiltrate information back to you or disrupt them or, or do whatever. So, so you would ask like, um, I would want the email of the CEO of this company or I, I would want the compromise information of at least one employee and the system could uh, find information somewhere on the internet or, or something else. Uh, I mean, that would just be like the recon phase. Yeah. So if you wanted to like train a model just to do recon, but I, I'm talking about sort of like actually attacking a network, finding a vulnerability, exploiting the vulnerability, basically like sort of fully automated hacking. Um, it's not clear like how far away we are from this. Um, I don't think anyone has made anything that's like all that competent right now. Um, but that, it's like, this is like, this is like a, the kind of capability we might want to think about. Um, that, yeah, it may, it may seem far off now, but I wouldn't be surprised if like in five years, we totally had this or something. And for, um, yeah, finding exploits in the network, would you, could, could you like solve this by just like limiting the, the number of like requests something? Would you like be able to like detect, like if the an AI would be able to make like a hundreds of requests uh, uh, an hour or something? Um, well, so the problem here is that like you're, now we're talking about like how do you prevent attackers from exploiting networks in general? So, so like this, there's already incentive to try to protect against these kinds of attacks. All, when, you, when we're talking about AI, all we're talking about is automating attacks that humans already do, right? So it's like there's, hackers are already going to use these techniques. You're already going to be like trying to use rate limiting and others like other sorts of techniques to try to prevent these attacks. Um, adding AI just potentially makes it faster and more powerful. Um, I think that one advantage or one way you get to superhuman performance here pretty quickly is that you can attempt to run a lot of attacks uh and so even if you have a low success rate um you can you know run inference faster than one subjective second per second um and so i suspect that the first types of new attacks we'll see will be on products where anyone can download them so so you can run um, attacks in your sandbox on your machine very quickly. So you'll see exploits for Microsoft Word before someone's closed source proprietary tech stack running on a server you don't control. Yeah, yeah, that seems right. And I mean, this is sort of already the case with with fuzzing techniques, right? Like, so, so like we already have like a huge amount, a huge class of sort of machine assisted um, exploit discovery, right? Where you're like, uh, like. You know, Google, Google, you know, uses a lot of compute to constantly be fuzzing Chrome um, and and looking for vulnerabilities in Chrome. Fuzzing, you know, for people who are not familiar with it, um, is a technique where you're just you basically you you have a a piece of software um, and it, it it accepts certain inputs and you just try you sort of try to intelligently search the input space to find behavior that might um, be undesirable. Um, and so, you know, so we sort of already have this sort of automated exploit development, but the idea is that this could become much, much smarter and that that could be a super big deal. 
I, so I, I think, yeah, I mean, one, one, another sort of classic thing to talk about in this space, and guys, feel free to jump in if, if I'm getting too off track, but um, sort of this, this question of like offensive and defensive balance, right? Because obviously we can also use AI systems for, for defense as well. But like, you know, so, so I think there are the, the, the sort of the kind of developments that might be more offensive dominant are the ones that are specifically, well, I so saw one example of, uh, of an offensive dominant type attack would be like automated binary exploitation. So when you're trying to find vulnerabilities in software, two ways you can do it is you can sort of do it in a way where you have access to the source code, or you can do it in a way where you don't have access to the source code. Maybe you have the program. So let's take Microsoft Word as an example. You have the, you have Microsoft Word, you know, running on your computer locally, but you don't have access to the source code because that's proprietary and Microsoft hasn't released it. If you can do exploitation on just the binary, that's something that's like more offensive dominant than when you can do exploits re that require the source code or, or, you know, like source code helps you a lot because defenders will have access to the source code generally. Microsoft is going to have access to their own source code. So when they're trying to find vulnerabilities in it, using the source code is a thing that they can do, but the attackers can't do. Um, and this is like not hypothetical. Like uh, if people have, there's a really interesting result of using um, uh, chat GPT to, uh, so, so one one of the things you do when you're trying to do um, binary exploitation is that you you take a binary, you take Microsoft Word or whatever, and then you um, you basically like like sort of decompile it. You like say so take the the compiled code and you try to turn it back into uncompiled code, and it's but it's kind of a mess. It's like really hard to understand what that code actually does. But Chat GPT, you can now sort of feed that the the outputs from that tool into Chat GPT, and Chat GPT can annotate all the code and like tell you what all the functions do, which like really speeds up the exploit development process. So it's a very cool tool, but it probably is more offensive dominant than, than defensive dominant. I think it's worth pointing out that there's maybe one third class of tool here, which is a tool where you can't even see the binary because it's not running on your computer. So that's true of Google search, right? You can interact with the service, um, which means that in principle, it's possible to exploit it. But uh, a big part of the attack surface, you can't even see the binary for, and so you can't decompile that. So. I would expect um, the first types of exploit tools to look at source code and then the next generation to look at binaries and the third generation, so to speak, to be able to attack remote machines. Yeah, no, that's a super good point. Um, and yeah, and I mean, like much software we're doing today is all sort of like running on uh, remote machines, like every, you know, every, every cloud app or every, every, just basically like every website. Uh, so yeah, and you know some of those some of those attacks you can attack locally, but yeah, a lot of that is is all via done via APIs. Sure. Like one of the key questions to see like if AI could be able to reverse engineer binary versus like a human doing it is just like um, it could do stuff faster. Or is there like other considerations here? Yeah, I mean I, I think like it's like really important to think about um, all of these systems are like currently like currently like the easiest way to use them is to augment human ab abilities, right? Um, and so sort of the thing I started with being like you can imagine automating the entire attack chain uh, is something that could be really desirable. But like for now, we're likely to see just like many, many tools that help assist with different parts of the process. Um, and yeah, I think the main benefits you get from this are speeding things up. Um, like I, I have yet to see any any sort of like AI assisted vulnerabilities that like would have been impossible for a human to discover. I haven't looked that hard. So, you know, like. And like maybe with fuzzing, like fuzzing probably finds things that humans are pretty unlikely to discover, but like we already have that class of thing. Um, but like in general, humans can can make really, really sophisticated exploits. Um, and maybe like a, an example I'd point to would be um, the the NSO group's um, exploit of iMessage, where they had a, a zero click exploit, um, where basically they, they sent a malformed GIF, but you could send a malformed GIF to a target iPhone. And it would like, it would basically without any, the user having to interact or even open that message, um, the i like i message within that iPhone would would sort of try to parse the GIF, and that triggered some some like library that had some vulnerability in it that led to sort of take basically taking over that iPhone. And it was a really sophisticated um, exploit. You can read about it on the the Project Zero blog. I can I can try to link to that. Um, but it's it's a really great example of like wow, this is like highly sophisticated engineering to sort of figure out how to make an exploit like that. Um, and I think so. I think something maybe you know, something something to watch out for. In terms of like uh, cyber cybersecurity, like like uh, red flags in terms of an AI capability is getting really really scary in this domain. Is if we ever see if we ever see like AI systems sort of like fully discovering a kind of exploit like that, or not just discovering it, but like actually crafting the exploit. Um, if, if I saw that, I'd be like, oh, okay, <laughs> we're in a totally different realm. <laughs> so like right now we're in the realm of like we can speed things up, um, or or like 
I'm, I guess a, a lot of these tools are very basic. Like the, like the chat GPT thing I was talking about with in terms of um, binary exploitation, which I should also try to link to um, in one second, but that's that's like a very new capability. It's, like, it's something very new that I haven't seen before. Yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is currently it looks like we're, we're approaching the realm of like, we're going to speed up a bunch of different kinds of exploit develop, uh, discovery and development. But I think we'll eventually we'll get to the point where like, We'll have AI systems that are like writing whole new classes of attacks, and and, and that that will be, I think, a very interesting, like an interesting, uh, a di different kind of capability. Do do I think for the iMessage thing, do, do, would you need planning or uh, just like a big enough action space? Like, what, 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 how would you discover this on your own? Yeah, I mean, I kind of have an idea. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, I don't. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure I should say if I did. Right. Because <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty. It's pretty <laughs> But I definitely don't. I mean, like, you know, I, I can come up with some ideas, but I mean, I, I think it's like, this is currently, it feels like, I don't, I don't want to say pretty far, but I'm, I'm currently like, it just doesn't feel like the thing that people are working on next. It seems like the, the thing that's like one or two steps out. Yeah, I will say, I don't think it's the kind of thing that the current type of AI tech can't in principle do. Agency and planning are an emergent phenomena of large language models. When you tell them they're an agent, they simulate being an agent and they're able to think and plan ahead if you give them space to think step by step. And so... I think that this is the, without going too much into detail here, I think that it's the kind of thing that I would expect to be possible without major changes in how we build general intelligences. Yeah, I mean, this feels like very much on the road to AGI to me, where it seems like a, a logical next thing to do is to like make these systems like be able to plan and be more agentic. Um, and, I, and I do think that like, the more agentic we make these systems, the more dangerous they'll be, both in terms of the short term, like as in being be able being able to be used by actors for harm. Um, like if you have an agentic system and you're trying and it's like a phishing, say it's like a phishing bot, you're like, hey, plan this phishing campaign against Microsoft. Look, try to identify details about each Microsoft employee, who their manager is, and then and like, you know, sort of like background on their families or whatever, their social, their context, how they like respond to emails and stuff like that, like whatever data that you have. Um, and then you like that, 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 um, that bot basically plans a phishing campaign and like sort of crafts all of the emails and like, and it like responds to the emails. It's not just like sending one, one and done. You could do that with the language model today, but like it actually sort of like keeps up this whole email thread and, and it tracks, you know, the different ones and how much they've succeeded and like collects stats on them. You know, like that's the kind of thing that I'm like, well, yeah, that's you know, now you're talking about an agent that can do sophisticated planning. And so I'm like, that kind of capability is dangerous. I think, you know, in terms of misuse, but then it's also going to be like on the road to AGI, which is dangerous, you know, at the existential level because, you know, those systems are like the kind that will be able to, like, you know, potentially, you know, be deceptively misaligned, um, sort of carrying out a treacherous turn, et cetera. One of the things that these models currently don't have is any sort of ability to shell out to, say, a SAT solver. And, you know, a lot of the ways that people have, or one of the ways that people have, like, classically approached trying to find exploits for systems is you are able to either do some sort of symbolic execution on your binary or, you know, do some other high level reasoning or some, some sort of planning. And, uh, you know, these things are notoriously bad at doing, you know, deep sorts of, of planning. But if you give them access to, I think, REPL and then like, uh, you know, Z3 or something, uh, where they're actually able to sit down and write out predicates and then have them shell out to get the answers, that's when you start actually, I think, cooking with uh, a system that has some sort of meaningful capability. Um, I mean, they clearly also struggle with planning for other reasons. Like, for instance, they have limited memory, right? The like 4096 token uh, buffer is like clearly an issue that needs to get resolved um, in order to be able to do any sort of like longer horizon planning. I basically don't think that it's true that they can't, sh that current generation systems can't show out. Um, there are tools for this already, but. Um, Lots of people have built uh, wrappers because they're useful for other things around large language models um, where you remind the large language model that it's bad at math and then it you give it access to a Python REPL to do calculations and things like that. So I think... I mean, I think the issue there is that one, uh, you know, you really do probably need access to an actual like SMT solver, not just like Python at large. Um, and two, I still think that they you run into the issue of you only have so many tokens, right? If it's going to spit out a program to solve a problem, uh, you either need to like delete from its memory what the program was, so it doesn't actually remember what it does, or you know you need to do something else to be able to preserve your, uh, you know your history. And uh, frankly, you probably need to move towards like either a pushdown automata or 
more likely like a straight up neural Turing machine in order to actually be able to do these sorts of like arbitrary horizon planning tasks. Um, I agree that the context window is a big limiting factor here. Um, although I, I'm not sure I understood your point about why a SAT solver would be different than a Python REPL. Like those seem like the same sort of task to me. I think that the uh, SAT or NSMP solver is a better like abstraction in order to be able to reason about whether or not you're able to, uh, you know, find a vulnerability versus say, uh, you know, writing arbitrary Python code. Right. This is traditionally what people have used in order to do program verification and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this, this all makes sense to me. I think I put this all in the category of like training models to use tools better to accomplish tasks. Um, yeah. And it just seems like this is so useful for a, a broad variety of tasks that um, in like hacking is definitely one of them. But like there are so many, you know, there are so many like this is what humans do. So like, of course, other, you know, other agents would want to do this, too. There's also like a question by Robert Long. A lot of concrete tales of AI takeover involves hacking of things. Example to get uh, compute access without being noticed. Does this seem pretty plausible? Any comments on those kind of scenarios? Example querns from a cyber perspective. I like Gwern's story a lot. Um, I think it. I think it's like it's definitely plausible at some capability level. And the question is like what capability level that is. If you imagine a fast takeoff where you like suddenly get superhuman capabilities in hacking, I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, but if you're imagining a slower takeoff where like you have around human level capabilities, but maybe you have some benefits, like for example, ability to like scale your your own model to have like a ton of like hacking agents or exploit development agents or something like that. Um, I think it's more complicated. Like it's definitely much easier to sort of penetrate a system than it is to sort of secret, you know, covertly penetrate a system and use a large amount of resources without getting noticed or shut down, right? Like at some level, it's like, okay, if you hack AWS enough, they're just going to pull the plug. There's like physical fail safes in some cases. Um, and but there's also questions of like, oh, can you re-architecture yourself and like run on consumer consumer grade CPUs or GPUs, which again is like, you know, what is your capabilities level? I, I think it's a good question. It's just like, oh, I can see a lot of potential scenarios there. I also think there's a less doomsday version of this or a on the way to doomsday version of this where you're, you can just buy compute, right? And so if you're an agent, that, agent that's capable of, you know, interacting with web pages and filling out surveys on Swagbucks to get, you know, cash to spend at AWS, then that maybe gets you the compute you need to scale your capabilities without being noticed. And, you know, that's not even really an exploit. I guess it's an exploit of survey taking or odd job you're working. You're letting an AI do it, not a human, but it's much less cut and dry as an exploit you have to get away with. This seems like a great place to tie back into AI governance because it seems like, hey, let's not have models buy more compute for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I guess how, how would you know? Like, you would just like, like ask for an ID for every time you you buy compute. I think I think do do AWS or Google Cloud ask for your ID. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, they don't unless you're trying to buy really very large amounts of compute, and you can basically create an arbitrary number of accounts buying small amounts of compute at least today. Yeah, here, here is where I think that if we think this is a realistic threat model, and I, and I think it could be, I don't, I don't have a clear sense of this right now, um, it might be a place to target regulation to say, hey, hey, we need like, we need really good compute monitoring. Like we, we really do not want um, AI systems to be able to grab compute without us noticing, like, like underline that a lot. <laughs> and so I think like, uh, you know, there's a question of like, well, how do you detect it? Or like, how do you make sure, how do you prevent against like multiple accounts? And these are all good questions. Um, and I think, you know, those are the questions that would need to in inform the regulations or, or you know, even, even before we get to the regulatory level, just like, I, I mean, it's, I don't think that AWS or, you know, I don't think Amazon and Google and all these other companies want, you know, rogue AIs running around grabbing market compute. Like, I mean, even if it's like still like working for a company, even if it's not like, you know, we're not talking about, yeah, like, like getting away from you, but just like having a lot of human oversight over that seems super wise. Yeah, I think it's hard to like ask um, right now, um, every like compute provider to like be, or, or like, ask for more regulation on this because if um if you could at some point like have ais automatic automatically like request more compute when they're like <laughs> not like by compute they, they could be like economic incentives in like <laughs> having ais do the thing for us but yeah I, I can see why in terms of safety it could be like um important yeah i mean maybe there's like a continuum from just like a cluster that auto scales to like the model asks for more compute right so i, I see what you're saying um, but I, but I also right. like, I also expect that there are some lines in the sand we could draw that, that companies would be probably down with. Like, I, I don't think that it's like, 
potentially that big of an issue, especially as like, you know, because like I think I, I, every company would agree with, with with the case, like, you know, some AI model that no one is controlling that's just like buying and buying more and more compute because it happens to like find a weird revenue model and just like is trying to scale itself to the whole internet. I'm like, yeah, no one wants that. So it seems like I mean, people might not believe it's possible, but like if they do, then I think they'll be down to like want to take some action on it. And then there's like the question of, well, what, what happens when you get closer to like, well, it is kind of working for the company, but it's kind of on its own too. And it's complicated. And yeah, that's more of a trickier case, but I think we could start with the obvious case and then like work inward. How realistic is it that your system is going to be able to like collect are there anybody noticing sufficiently large amounts of compute that they're able to meaningfully self-improve, right? And if that's, so if that's the threat model, right? Like, is it really the case that computes the uh, limiting factor and not say data, right? Like, I don't know, I'm a little bit skeptical of like, uh, you know, oh, we need to start like gaming out uh, limits because our theoretical AI system is gonna start filling out surveys in order to get enough money to be able to buy enough, you know, uh, H100s to to scale up its its training. I'd also say that you want to be focusing much more on entrance compute than training compute. And that if you have a system that's already human level intelligence, it might not need to train itself for that much longer. It might just be scaling up the number of subjective seconds it can simulate for every clock second. And at that point, that's probably good enough to do some pretty pretty real damage i think the inference yeah. compute point is really good like basically because like it, it suggests that like uh marginal amounts of compute might st still be really useful or, or or like maybe not even marginal amounts but like much less much less than like your training like much less than than training costs like training costs might be huge and then like you're working with imagine like you're working with this like model in in a lab environment where you're really only yeah you're only running like you know one one to, to 50 copies of this model. Um, and then if it can like suddenly grab compute for a thousand, like that's actually a huge increase in terms of its potential capabilities. Um, and and I, I don't think this is unrealistic. Like if we're talking about like working with models where we're like, well, we think they're kind of aligned in some ways, but like, and they're like kind of corrigible, but like also we're not really sure. And like, we don't necessarily know whether we're in like an extremely dangerous domain or not. And we're trying to be really careful. Like like sort of sort of like if that if that suddenly can grab more compute and like you know this is probably like there's a lot of cybersecurity controls you want before thinking about just like compute regulation um I, I granted for sure but like i do think we want to think about like not just letting it like burn uncontrolled on the on the internet of compute like on compute like right because like that's like i don't know it seems like you could potentially get like it could get away from you very quickly in in that environment especially if it's like not superhuman yet. it's just like quite smart all right i have a dumb question why is it that there's this AI that's just allowed to scale and consume arbitrarily large amounts of compute, right? Somebody had to have created it. Why are they allowing this agent to just be economically independent, right? If, if you're the one who built it, why wouldn't you be the one who wants to collect the value from it, filling out the surveys and whatever, and you know, making the decisions how much it can scale and whatever. And at which point it's not a question of whether, you know, the government has to make sure that it's not an AI asking to, to ask for compute to scale up, it's asking, you know, whether this corporation who wants to extract value from it, right? Like, I don't know. That's why I always have trouble with these scenarios is like people seem to like skip over the part where somebody made this AI system and now they've just released it in the world and don't want to capture value from it. I and, think, and I feel like um, people would notice like along the trajectory here, right? Something's up. Like, it's not just the case. It's like, you're going to wake up one morning and all the EWS computes used by a, uh, AI that, you know, doesn't have a progenitor and, uh, and whatnot. One potential avenue for this looks like you deploy a fairly general intelligence uh, with a goal. You have some system where it comes up with a plan and then starts executing on it. And it works, you know, a few times in your testing environment. And so you deploy it. And then once you're running it at scale, you end up with a, you know, generation that says, to solve this problem, I need uh, more compute. How can I get more compute as a plan in an unsupervised environment? as an instrumentally useful goal for whatever your terminal goal is, because having more compute is a... Yeah, but then the organization who made it, idea. it like, will terminate the system because it's blowing through their AWS bills, doing form fillouts in order to then sign up for more AWS instances, right? In worst case scenario, you, you call AWS and you're like, listen, I accidentally released a worm, like, very sorry, please turn it off, like... Thank yeah. you. Well, that's not the worst case scenario. I mean, I think, I think, I think, like you're, you're, I think what you're saying is, um, okay. It seems like it seems like in the early stages, companies will still be able to have control over these systems. Like that one that they'll want control, and two that they'll be able to maintain control. 
Um, and so I think we can talk about failure cases that are like various ways in which they lose control. Um, so sort of analogously, um, you can look at like, say the WannaCry uh, ransomware virus, right? Where like the, I think it's the, probably the North Koreans developed it, but it seems like maybe it actually got out of their labs before they intended to release it because there was like a URL that they didn't register that was basically like a, a shutoff switch. Like the worm would basically like call out to that domain and if it existed would like stop um or like and so and then like some you know the hacker who discovered it basically like registered that domain and was able to stop the spread of this thing so like the the thing is is that like we, we don't know but it seems plausible that like as as these systems are developed intentionally to be more agentic to be able to plan more and act more on their own like that people intentionally try to make them that way that they'll start to become more like something in the space of like wanna cry where it actually can sort of replicate and spread on its own and that was obviously a very unsophisticated virus in terms of like it didn't adapt it was just like using a zero day and just like sort of using that zero day again and again until it couldn't anymore but if you imagine a system like that that also can plan and develop new exploits and things like that um you could potentially see it getting away from a company that didn't intend that to happen but the compute requirements in order to have enough cognition to be able to do that are so enormous you can't just infect like mommy and daddy's computer right you have you, to go how infect. Do you, no how do you how do you know that like look at look at state like look at stable diffusion you can run that on your macbook and it can generate like super cool ai art it's also not know. doing like long horizon planning trajectories though right like that was sure. part of the key capability right you have some sort of trade-off between its ability to do planning and its current computation I mean, you using right i mean the weights of your model are large enough that you need at present, you know, 8x, 80 gigabyte, 8 100s. Like, I don't know where you're gonna find the equivalent storage. Yeah, I just wanna comment on that. I mean, I think I wanna say like, yeah, yeah, totally. If you're talking about a model that can only run on a particular kind of architecture, which is, yeah, totally the kind of language models we're developing today, like, sure. Yeah, like, w given that architecture, it's not going to be able to just like copy itself and run itself on some arbitrary computer. Like, I think that's a good point. And yeah, and I mean, and I think that this is also like, yeah, we so we should target in terms of like monitoring, we should target our monitoring towards the kinds of systems that can run the kind of models that we're concerned about. Um, that just seems smart. I think you have a really good point there. I also think it's possible that like in, in the future, these models could get become like, like re-architected to work on different kinds, like to, to paralyze things more, to work on different kinds of inf like infrastructure, to work on different kinds of environments. Like, you know, and then, you know, we hopefully we'll see that happening. Hopefully it won't happen all at once and we can prepare for it. But um, I guess what I'm just saying is like, that's a huge constraint right now. I'm not convinced that it's going to be a huge constraint in the future. That's why I'm talking about a scenario like that. But yeah, I mean, what you're saying is true right now. And I think that that's a good point. It's, it's very, it makes sense to sort of try to target compute monitoring at the kinds of compute that can run the models that are the most powerful right now, especially given, yeah, like, yeah, I think absent some really fast takeoff, it's probably true that these models are going to be constrained to run on this kind of compute. I would be really careful about making assumptions about how easy it is to do this kind of compute monitoring, especially, yeah, once you have like, a huge amount of compute you're talking about and you're really talking about a really small fraction of it that you that a, that a model might need to use in order to like actually do a lot um but yeah we should target the compute monitoring on like on the basis of like what kind of compute we think is most likely to be useful um that seems right i mean another another point on though on like if you're talking about sort of like an ai system that's doing sort of like more cyber operations is that it's um you know if you have a really intelligent system um it's likely to figure out how to like make much smaller models that can do that can do learning locally or like at least do more complex information processing not even necessarily models it could just be you know demons or agents or something like that on on sorry not agents in that in that sense but like uh classical kind um and then sort of yeah take over consumer grid hardware and not be using those to sort of like be doing any sort of long-term planning but be using those for like i don't know like a bunch of like local subtasks or like you know, maybe you can develop models that can do local exploit development or do like simple sort of recon or, or, or simple like network um, lateral movements um, or information exfiltration, right? So you can still potentially use hardware, yeah. So are you saying that like, you know, a good line first pass, this is building better AWS monitoring infrastructure, right? Because that's what it sounds like, right? If every company on earth had really good AWS monitoring was really on the ball when something drastic changed, then like this is non-issue or severely curtailed. I think that would be a great first step. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, starting with the cloud providers and getting really great monitoring, it would be awesome. I'd be super happy to see that. I mean, really you'd be sensitive to things monitoring. like infill. Right. Like even if you have your 178 billion parameter model quantized to four bits, right? That's still an 88 gigabyte blob that you're infilling and then doing inference on. Right. It has to come from somewhere. Like that's the sort of thing that you would you would have some sort of network monitoring on or something. I want to distinguish between uh, compute monitoring where the purpose is to sort of like 
try to like understand like what different AI companies or, or labs are doing or sort of, sort of sort of like a what is the audit uh, auditability requirements of, of companies that are developing this or individuals um, from distinguishing between compute uh, monitoring that is aimed at sort of like detecting like rogue models or something um, or like in some way detecting rogue models is like more and more like maybe might be totally possible at first but might be like pretty doomed as you get to like really high capabilities level um, and I'd sort of ex expect like the um, maybe potentially still worth doing but like maybe the the cybersecurity controls that are going to be trying to deal with more powerful models are probably more on the level of like um like sort of like uh yeah i don't know they're like sort of more towards just like the alignment strategy that you're using like how are you how are you actually like uh how are you actually working with danger with models that you think could be potentially really dangerous like how are, how are you sandboxing them in your in your local environments how are you monitoring you know if you're an ai company and you have tons of compute how are you monitoring your own compute like before we even talk about sort of like you know ev everyone else just like how are you making sure that like you know you, you don't see some some runaway scenario um and, and i also think it's like we're, it's a very different question if we're talking about like uh fast takeoff or slow takeoff like uh, and, and I, I don't know. I know a lot of the AI labs are very skeptical of sort of a, a fast takeoff, and I'm, I'm like, mm, yeah, maybe. But I, I'm, I'm less skeptical. I'm like, it seems actually possible. And then at some point, it makes it, it's really important that like when that takeoff would occur or something like at, at what capability level or, or what compute levels, because I think the threat models for those different situations are really different. One thing is I, I believe uh, these tools will keep getting better for exploit discovery, and I think eventually they'll get very good. I don't expect that to take that long, but I. I don't know. Also, exploit discovery is complicated, and I don't feel like making a strong prediction here. Um, but like, saving my medium or weak prediction is that they'll they'll get pretty good in the next few years. Um, in which case, I think, uh, especially if they're like, I mean, one question is just like, are are, are bigger models like way more useful? Um, and if they are, I, I don't know. But if they are, um, then I think, uh, yeah, it seems very important for, um, like, okay, I mean, analogy would be like if we suddenly had like. 10 or five or even three more um project zeros like google's exploit uh uh discovery uh lab but that would be immensely positive for i mean ai labs for sure um aw you know compute providers for sure also just the whole internet like that'd be really good so i think to the extent that like uh there is sort of a compute advantage to exploit discovery and that that and that can be wielded in a really positive way which i mean if you have it yeah you should be able to like like project zero is a great example of they have, they have amazing like they have amazing security researchers those security researchers could be using their talents to like find zero days and sell them to governments or or criminals or whoever that just, that are going to exploit them but instead they like google is like doing a public good by being like we're going to find these exploits we're going to responsibly disclose them we're going to wait a while we're going to wait for them to be patched and then we're going to release them i mean it's it's a little complicated but like i'm like yeah if we could have models that would do that i would be so happy to, to do that and i think most of the ai companies would be pretty on board and pretty willing to do it in a very responsible way. Like, and, and I mean, I've like worked for labs before and I think that this seems like, you know, that saying like what exactly they do, I, my suspicion is that like most people in this space, most labs in this space would be very happy to do that if they could. I think that that's very likely. Um, also, I have to go, but it's been great talking to you guys. Yeah, I need to run to you. Thanks guys.